So good morning, everyone. Um, I feel a little uh, disoriented. I was here on Monday, had to run back, come back today. And um, so I, I want to, uh, so I hope this makes some sense, you know, at the end of the, the, this presentation. I thought I would uh, actually focus on a very, uh, rather than try to capture the sort of the entire landscape of what the mouse um, ENCO project was like and how it was compared to the, uh, what we found to the human one. But I'd like to focus in on a very specific area because in some ways I think vis-a-vis um, -vis the uh, interests that each of you have, often it's less the whole gamut of a whole genome but more specific kinds of questions which call into to uh, use some portions of the data. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about that, and I hope um, I hope I can convince you that uh, both from a global point of view and also from a fairly narrow, specific point of view, uh, the, the data uh, in, provided by ENCODE is of some value. So let me begin with a, um, a, uh, a set of, a, a summary graph, which we actually um, talked about in a paper uh, about two or three years ago, it, it actually was the summary paper for the phase two uh, ENCODE project and, and, and the transcriptome uh, studies. And this is, um, has, oh, this, I love this figure. I, I, it took me a long time to put it together, but I really love this fi uh, figure because it really triggered a whole variety of questions, which I hope we can address in, in the following uh, slides. This, this presentation, this figure basically points to the fact that um, when you look at the landscape of expression of the human transcriptome, and you, you do that admittedly in a very narrow range of biological uh, circumstances, namely 15 cell types, all of which are, uh, are uh, you know, have been in culture for a long time, even the ones that are primary have been around for a while. Um, and we also looked at not only this narrow range, but also in, in a few of those cell types, what was going on in the nucleus, what was going on at chromatin, what was going on at the cytosol in terms of what the, uh, what the RNA profile looked like there. And um, uh, about uh, in this 15%, 15 cell lines and so forth and different compartments, we saw about 70% of all of the uh, annotated uh, uh, gene regions uh, from GenCode uh, expressed. And how they sort of played out was that um, there were, if you, if you divided arbitrarily the world of, of transcription into the annotated protein coding uh, genes uh, and the uh, annotated non-protein coding genes, and all of the new material that we, all the new uh, RNA transcripts, which admittedly are uh, less defined in terms of their boundaries because they're really models, right, made from cufflinks uh, uh, estimates of what, of what the transcripts tell us and where the splice sites for those are. And we clearly saw that if you do, uh, look at the, uh, the level, the log um, uh, expression of the, uh, what you see in the nucleus versus the cytosol and the um, uh, the uh, levels of expression in, for each of those categories of genes. So each point within these clouds is a given uh, gene in each of the 15 different cell lines. All right? And you can see that there is a natural and very clear um, centroid for both the protein coding genes, uh, which is more lo localized in the cytosol, and uh, the non uh, the annotated non-coding genes, which uh, is, uh, again, that centroid moves more towards the nucleus, but nevertheless that cloud is shifted clearly to lower uh, uh, levels of expression. And finally, to the novel things that, again, admittedly uh, are not as well defined as the other two categories, but clearly a much more nuclear-oriented uh, collection of genes and very much uh, lower expression than the centroid seen for the uh, protein uh, coding regions. Now, there's about six logs of separation, all right, over that uh, range of, of uh, expressed genes. And so one of the things that, um, that intrigued us about this was that, you know, this very large level of expression difference, how well was that uh, was that always, was, was the probability uh, that any given gene could fall anywhere along that dynamic of six logs, 
Or was there a, a much more defined set of genes which, whose expression range was much more narrowly capable of being varied? And so that's really the subject of what I want to talk about here. Because when we went to the mouse uh, uh, studies, we revisited this question. And so let me give you a little uh, quick background uh, for those of you unfamiliar, that the study for the mouse uh, uh, and human studies differed considerably. And this, at first, we thought was a very significant um, failing in the experiment. Because basically, we had 18 cell lines from the mouse, uh, from the human uh, study, and 25 tissues, all right, from five different uh, developmental stages for the mouse. So we had tissues and cell lines. And so making comparisons or, and finding out whether any differences there were actually attributable to the two different species would obviously be confounded by this very fundamental change. But on the other hand, um, we, th we thought that if this idea that there was a, this dynamic range of expression and the variability of that expression all right, was maintained despite, was, there was a story there that was maintained despite the variation in the biology that we were comparing here. We, we would then ask the question of whether that, that feature was actually a fundamental feature of things uh, uh, greater than just mouse and human. In addition, we, every sample had multiple, bio, at least two biological replicates. Very importantly, the, the, we can say at the level of reproducibility that the, uh, using IDR, that these were uh, highly reproducible results in every sample. And uh, there had to be at least a, if we were talking about a splice site or uh, initiation site for a transcription, a minimum of at least five uh, uh, set of, uh, of reads for that particular um, sample. We used poly A plus RNA, and we, uh, we sequenced paired N100s uh, with about 400 million reads per replicate, okay? So this is very deep sequencing, all right? Fairly extensive coverage. Uh, in fact, for any annotated gene, it was not called actually as being present as the gene unless 90% coverage of that gene was ab absolutely observed. So it wasn't enough to see patches of anything. You actually had to see full coverage of that particular gene. Now, I'm going to use the word conservation in a couple of seconds, and I want to make sure that, we, that you understand that I'm not using it in the, in the strict genetic sense. I'm not arguing that what we found was well, maintained, this conservation was maintained by purifying selection. This is a more generic way of using uh, conservation. That is to say, they are maintained by mechanisms which may be other than uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, selection. The two points to remember in, as we go forward in this is that the differences in the sample types and species underscores uh, underscores the significance of any similarities, all right? Because again, there's such a wide diversity of the biology of what we're studying. And the conserved features hi highlighted are not dependent on common sequences. In other words, they do not have to be uh, the fact that, that if we see this feature, they share a conserved set of sequences around them, all right? All right, so the, please remember those two features. Now, <clears throat> what we saw in the first slide this can be exemplified by the fact that if we look at any given cell type, right, we can either see something that's relatively abundant, let's say cytosolically uh, localized, or very rare, something less than one, one copy per cell. All right? and, and often that triggers a, a, a sort of sense of caution on the part of uh, 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 people who, who study this, like, like myself, and, and we wonder, you know, what, should we actually worry about these, these rare expressed genes? And so what we see is that, uh, that, as many of you are already familiar, that we have examples, well, such as JAS1F in this case. This is a work that uh, uh, a figure I asked from um, Arun Raj, uh, and he generously sent it to me that you, you, these each point, each fluorescent point in, this, in the JAS1F is a, is a single um, uh, transcript label, uh, decorated with at least 50 uh, fluorescent probes. So we're seeing here the, roughly the number of transcripts for JAS1F, which you can clearly see is predominantly cytosolic and averages on the order of about 10 to 15 copies per cell. 
In the case of HOXD10, uh, all right, that, uh, that gene in, this, uh, in, this cell, in these cell lines, uh, it, uh, this, this gene has an antisense transcript, which is expressed, uh, a non-tonic, which is expressed at less than 10 copies per cell. I mean, uh, much less than that. And what you can see here is that in this field, virtually no cell has indication of this except for one. And again, it's a highly nuclear localized transcript in this. Uh, so in the context of what we're about to say, all right, whether we're talking about uh, high levels of expression or low levels of expression, right, it in fact is important to realize that there may be talking about different programs that are ongoing when we talk about these different levels of expression. Namely, in some, they could be quite highly expressed even though the overall number is quite low. Now, when we finished the mouse uh, project, what we, uh, and, uh, well, we, we found that we could in, in fact um, uh, see that the, uh, the relatively undeveloped nature of the annotations for the mouse genome. Um, what we saw was that there were, uh, uh, initially that there were about 90,000 annotated transcripts for, uh, for the uh, mouse in gen code. And we found about another 200,000 novel transcripts in the mouse. Uh, again, most of these being uh, 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 created by doing um, uh, cufflinks modeling, but then supported by having information such as the five prime start site and the polyadenylation site uh, is uh, comprising some of these transcripts. And many of these are now ha have been incorporated into the uh, gen, uh, gen code annotation set. And that brought that total transcripts up to about 290,000. And in human, we, there were 164,000 and we found about 151,000. So almost, uh, we're starting to approach parity in terms of the number of transcripts in mouse and uh, in human. Now, uh, strikingly, one of the things that increased dramatically was the non-coding transcripts. For the mouse, there were about, about 3,900 uh, uh, non-coding genes and the human had 10,000 non-coding genes. Now, that number now is still is about 6,000 uh, non-coding genes in, uh, in mouse and, and about 12,000 in, um, in, uh, in human. So there's still a, uh, a lack of parity very much in this ca class of RNAs, which we think will eventually resolve by additional analysis of different uh, sample types. Now, when we looked at these data, this is all sort of leading up to the story that I'd like to go over with you, is that when we looked at this data, and we did it on a very 60,000 foot level, and we correlated the expression across the mouse and human genomes, just gross correlation, just comparing the, level, the average, level, the, uh, average um, uh, read density with the average level of expression, all right? And if you do that uh, across irrespective of coding, non-coding, uh, uh, novel genes, you see that for, whole, for the whole genome uh, and for um, uh, regions that you could align because there are orthologs between the two species, all right, you had a fairly interesting, a sizable uh, correlation of about 0 0.6, 0 0.7, all right, even though there's virtually no filtering going on. So that across the entire two genomes, the gross level of expression of RNA was relatively highly correlated in area in genes that we could actually compare. If you take alignable but non-homologous, non-orthologous gene regions in mouse and human, you, you got a statistically significant but not very impressive about 0.4 uh, uh, um, for uh, 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 point co uh, correlation. Now, the comparison in terms of those, that gross level, at, in, at in terms of what the levels of dynamic range were of, of, of expression, uh, gave us this, a similar result, all right, in both human and mouse, all right, of about six orders of magnitude, as we saw about three or four years ago in the, in the uh, human uh, analysis. Now, if we look at the orthologs, all right, just to give us a context before we actually uh, delve into that, if we look at the context, we saw about 20,000 expressed genes, all right, uh, 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 in mouse, uh, and these 20,000 genes were, uh, were 
uh, compared to about 18,000, I'm sorry, 20,000 mouse express genes and 18,000 human uh, express genes. And these are all protein coding genes that are expressed. Now, the overlap between them that um, are sort of orthologous uh, is, and expressed is a, between mouse and human is about 15,000 genes of, of those that are orthologous and expressed and shared between mouse and human. Of those 15,000, if you extend the analysis to about six different species, all right, rather than just human, all right, you have about uh, 6,000 of those 15,000 genes that are expressed in diff six different species, all right, and, uh, and are orthologous among the six. Now, if you look at the levels of expression, if you correlate the, um, the log of the expression in terms of its mean, its max, or its minimum levels of expression, all right, and you compare that to the dynamic range of that gene, all right, over all the different cell types and tissues that we have, what we saw was that there was a class of uh, expression which was very correlated between mouse and human, as you can see across this, di uh, this diagonal. And, but there was this uh, collection of genes all right, that looked like their uh, log expression and max expression was much more variable. In other words, its dynamic range of expression was much more variable in, uh, in, in the uh, comparison of uh, mouse and human. You can see this because if you look at the correlation of the number of genes in mouse and human that, uh, that have sort of a, a maximal level of expression, they have a very similar distribution of genes that have relatively the same sort of maximal level of expression. But if you actually look at the number of genes that are expressed, excuse me, that are expressed uh, in, in between mouse and human that are uh, uh, that are different in terms of their range of expression, you see the, the beginnings of two populations, as we saw with that uh, scatter plot. One which had a fairly uh, a, large, a large number of genes, which had relatively a large uh, set of, uh, of variation over here, and one that had much less variation. Uh, if you look at a sort of a two-dimensional plot of this, and you deconvolve the, the, the data that's there, what you see is that the number of genes uh, in the two is relatively similar, although the, there is much, uh, uh, there is so, there's a degree of greater in terms of having a greater variation than those are having uh, a, a, con a, a constrained set of variations. And what you see now is that what the two gene populations that you see between uh, seen in both hum, human and mouse, basically uh, turn into a bimodal distribution of genes which have a, uh, a, um, a variation in their expression of about two logs, which very rarely actually uh, extend past this two logs of variation. In other words, there is a class of genes where who's irrespective of what tissue you have or irrespective of what species you have, all right, do not vary their expression more than two logs. All right? And this was uh, quite striking to us. And um, the constrained um, uh, variation of, of genes represented a sizable portion of the total mass of the RNA that was actually being produced in all the cell types that we were looking at. So these constrained uh, uh, group of uh, genes were not just making a small amount of RNA uh, that you see consistently in cells, but 40% of all the mass of all this RNA are RNA made within a very narrow range of variation irrespective of the species and or uh, uh, um, uh, cell type or tissue from which it was uh, obtained. So if you go back to the original uh, slide that we were talking about before and, uh, and look and uh, see that roughly that the, the um, uh, we indicated that roughly 15,000 genes that were orthologs between mouse and human um, were expressed. And of those 15,000, uh, we indicated that um, in six different species, about 6,000 of them were, uh, were also expressed uh, and orthologs. But of, the, of that, roughly 6,000 of these all right, are constrained all right, in human and mouse, and about 
2,500 are constrained within all six species. All right? So this, this, again, this population of orthologous genes, all right, although are, are uh, seem to be uh, shared in terms of their capacity to be strained, about 30%, 40% are uh, uh, expressed, but their expression is constrained between the uh, species. So in summary, what we see is that about 70 to 80% of mouse uh, and human orthologs are expressed in comparing cell lines versus tissues. Remember, these are very different biological uh, conditions. 40% of the orthologous genes expressed in mouse and human are expressed in f at least four other species. About 40%, 44% are expressed in mouse and human orthologs have constrained expression. That is to say, about uh, less than two logs of variation in any tissue. And about 17% of the orthologue genes expressed in mouse and human are constrained in their expression. And finally, about 40% of the expressed mouse and human orthologue genes uh, constrained in their expression are constrained in, in the other species. So this immediately triggered a sense in our, in our mind that maybe these genes are critical to the, expression, uh, to the uh, survivability and to the functioning of, of cells. And when we went back and looked at the, the overall uh, correlation between expression and, um, and mouse and human, we could see that this uh, this uh, constrained set of expression was the reason why you see this, this uh, correlation between mouse and human in this global sense. And when you, when you see that, you wonder, is this collection of constrained genes the genes that are part of the housekeeping mechanisms for these cells, ir irrespective of what cell type it is or what membership it is? And that triggered the question of, what is a housekeeping gene? We use this term almost you know, invariably in every sort of study that we, uh, and we attribute a lot of biological meaning or use it as an exclusion class for many different types of studies. But if you look at the literature and ask, is there some kind of commonality to what is actually called a, a, a housekeeping gene, then what you see is that uh, it, taking a, a range of uh, studies, I only put a few up here, from, uh, from last year down for another 10 years ago, there's very little overlap of what people call exp you know, housekeeping genes in, in, those, uh, in those studies. And uh, so as a proposal, what I would argue is that one of the things that came out of this comparison of mouse and human was that there was a, a principal definition of what a housekeeping gene is. In other words, it's a gene that's whose variation in levels of expression is constrained, irrespective of its biological origin, all right, uh, and, um, or uh, in terms of species or cell type. And having this principle method uh, or definition would give us a mechanism by which we could actually make these kinds of discernible comparisons of whether things are uh, constrained uh, or housekeeping or not or non housekeeping. Remember this this other class of genes that are highly variable, that are likely to be cell type specific or tissue type specific. And so I would go back to the uh, the earlier uh, presentation that basically uh, asked the question of whether uh, mutations in those regions of tissue type specific genes, all right, are the principal causative element, or how much of this is actually shared among these genes that have these constrained levels of expression and then now are forced out of that perhaps constrained uh, element. Now, one last uh, uh, set of observations from, the, from these studies was that if you, you ask the question, you know, um, do these constrained does do these constrained genes share, for example, sequence conservation at the regulatory regions or within uh, sites that are could be used to actually control the levels of expression, like sites around splicing uh, or things? And what you see is that there is very little sequence conservation in the uh, regulatory regions of these constrained genes, or and or among the um, other regions that could be responsible for their levels of expression. The other interesting thing is, though, that when you go back and look at the data collected by other groups uh, in the mouse ENCODE project, what we saw was that 
the constrained genes have patterns of histone modification which are quite different than those which are present in the unconstrained. Now, you might say, well, this has to be true because the unconstrained class all right, generally has a, a lower level of expression than the constrained as a group. So you would likely see more active marks in those sites. But it doesn't explain everything, all right? Because there are many genes which have relatively low levels of expression that still have pr prominent marks, all right, compared to its orthologue in in um, uh, in, the, in the unconstrained class. So um, using the mouse uh, and encode epigenetic uh, marks, we this this sort of suggests or points in the direction that there is a there is a a that these two classes of genes are under different kinds of regulation, that there is a kind of global regulation that allows for this constraint to be maintained and uh, compared to those which are in the unconstrained class. Finally, other questions which remain to be resolved is that what is this mechanism that uh, is responsible for this uh, uh, maintain, maintenance and inheritance of, of, uh, of, con of constraint in, or vari in, in the variation? Uh, and then, um, do these pro uh, do these does this property extend to the non-coding transcripts? And we, I can tell you that, in fact, we've looked at this now, at least in terms of the annotated ones. And the answer is yes. In the non-coding class of RNAs, there are many. Uh, uh, there are clearly a subdivision in constrained versus unconstrained. And so, I'd like to end uh, on that topic and welcome any of your questions. And um, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where do you stand on the issue of transcriptional noise for the non coding group? So, um, you know. This is going to turn into a philosophical discussion. But, um, but the, the, the question is, um, noise in the sense that is often it's, uh, it's been used is a pejorative term, meaning that it is a, it is a RNA whose uh, role is either unknown or not important to the cell. All right? And it's just a byproduct of um, activities that are more stochastic than actually uh, regulated in some kind of a developmental program or expression program. And th the problem I've always had with this is that this well may be true, all right, but it, I think it, you have to ask yourself, what happens to in the circumstance where you have transcription occurring in, in a, a given region, and, and, for, and because you're a god, you, you know that there's no actual biological function for that, but the act of transcription is there. Right? Is, that a, is that a functional molecule? Because you now have to have this transcriptional event, even though its product itself is not directly important. So, so the answer to that is that, my, in my personal bias, is that there is, there is highly likely uh, this kind of random and uh, 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 sort of variable kinds of expression that goes on in the cell which for all, the, uh, because of their ra randomness, is not actually uh, predictable and under control. But, but I don't have an opinion as to whether that is something that's essential for the cell because it, its mere presence, its mere creation, in fact, may be an important attribute of the cell. Yes, just one comment. It's so difficult. Um, I don't know if you know the answer to the question of how many non-coding RNAs, especially the ones around 200 base pairs or so, have actually been validated functionally. And the ones that have, um, how many have only been validated by knocking them down and not by impeding their transcription, per se? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that number is, but it seems to be very small, right? I'll just give you one number. The number of non-spliced transcripts that we annotated in phase two it was twice the number of the non-coding uh, spliced transcripts. So it's something in the order of about 250,000 non-coding, non-spliced transcripts, which never really made it into any database because of the concern that 
this, in fact, could be a background DNA or, or incompletely spliced things. Hello. That was really nice. I'm Dan Gaddy from the Jackson Laboratory. So if my understanding is correct, um, most of the human cell lines come from different people, and so they have some gen genetic diversity in them. But most of the mouse tissues came, come from C57 black six males, eight, eight weeks old. Not all, but most of them. What effect do you think that sort of narrow selection of murine genetic diversity has on your selection of the genes that correlate between humans and mice? So um, we've repeated this analysis now with human tissue and, uh, uh, and compared it to the mouse tissue. And we still see this very clear collection of many of the same genes that we had seen here of constrained population versus not. So in the human populations, they were also males and females uh, present. And they were tissues as opposed to um, transformed or uh, immortalized cell lines. I guess I'm, I'm mostly asking about the, the selection of like the mouse tissues though. It's understandable. You, if you're doing a whole bunch of tissues, you've got to sort of narrow your like focus so they pick one strain. But if you start looking in like other inbred strains, do you expect that set would like get larger, smaller, I don't know, or how Well, I mean, what we see when we go to other species is the same general principle, albeit that um, these other species had um, smaller number of genes that, which were orthologs and could make the comparison. So to the degree in which we've extended it past the mouse, right, would argue that if we went to other strains, we would still see the same um, uh, principle of, these, of a group of genes being highly constrained in their variation, right, uh, but nevertheless, uh, maybe smaller number. Um, very nice talk. I've been waiting the last two days to ask you these uh, technical questions, and we can follow up um, you know, during the coffee break uh, uh -huh. if it is not the right place. So first is that um, you, are sh you are showing that this is a nuclear transcript, this is a cyto uh, you know, plasmic transcript. In my case, uh, you know, I have to look at nuclear transcript, cytosolic transcript, and vesicular transcript. Uh, so what strategies that you suggest for uh, proper normalization? Because um, I face a real problem um, doing that. That is my first question. Yeah. Um, so um, the, the, in the case of normalization, we used a couple of different approaches. One was basically to normalize using the spikins that, uh, that we put into, the, um, into each of the experiments. Um, the other is to basically extrapolate based on the total num amount of RNA that was actually isolated from each of the compartments. So those two methods um, were used to uh, first to determine whether we got similar kinds of re results, and then, but also to take into account that obviously there's a lot less RNA in the uh, in the nucleus than they're in the cytosol. Okay. My second question is that um, what is the advantage of uh, the paired in reads now that we can have very long single end reads covering most of the insert size? So, <laughs> yeah, well, are you talking about um, like pack bio reads or? Uh, yeah, m uh, maybe um, uh, life technologies, proton, or even for Illumina, yeah. Yeah. So we, we have a lot of experience with that. Um, I mean, number one, you don't have enough money in, in your grant to actually do this experiment using PacBio, or uh, th it's a very expensive technology. And um, number two, you could argue that by enrichment, selection mechanisms, you could go after things which are you know, either um, not well characterized or you want better um, uh, resolution about what's going on. But in our hands, and I think in the hands of many, many uh, labs that have uh, been doing this, this enrichment approach has been um, relatively inefficient. I mean, I mean, roughly 20% of everything that you target, all right, winds up uh, having some kind of analysis capable of being done. The other 80% is off-target things that show up in your experiment. So um, the, it isn't that it's not valuable at those off-targets, but it, uh, the bulk of what you're actually spending time and effort on, in fact, are not the things that you want to learn more about. So I, I think long reads have a, have, have a, a uh, significant uh, improvement both in cost and tech, 
technology development in order for it to be really challenging to the short read. Uh, Sorry, my, um, uh, my question was like, if we can just do 200 base pair, you know, or 250, oh. um, you know, reads instead of doing paired end 100 bases. So, do you see any benefit for the paired end? Uh, in the case of the 200 base or longer reads that compared to the paired end reads, uh, the, the advantage is that you have these, um, the capability of covering larger dis, uh, distances in terms of the, of the transcriptome. You know, you, the average insert size can vary you know, to 500, 600 nucleotides. So that, in fact, could, in fact, be what's you know, in that in middle, middle piece. And by, uh, by inference, you can, in fact, uh, ask and determine things that are not in the sequence but in between the two paired ends that you can't do by, from a single uh, 200 nucleotide or 400 nucleotide read. Thank you. And the last one is very simple, I think. Uh, it's, um, are you reaching um, any sort of saturation with 400 million reads, or what do you think that, you know, uh, one, uh, one transcript per cell, um, what's the state? So I, the answer is that the, most of the non-coding region, uh, coding RNAs, um, it, are s still relatively uh, undeveloped. And this is, comes from the long reads it, uh, and from uh, race experiments. So uh, we have, um, I think, still an appreciable learning curve for the non-coding RNA. And, and even for the annotated coding regions, um, the number has jumped from about five transcripts per coding region to about nine or 10 based on the increased uh, depth and uh, resolution that we're capable of uh, achieving now. Thank you. All right, we're gonna break now. Uh, please meet back here at 10.